Just when we thought we were over the worst, more unexpected hard labour. When we prepared the subfloor for the old house, we also laid some of the 804 gravel on the base of the garage. It was the last job at the end of the day and everyone was tired. Only when Noel and Sid came to lay the insulation a few days ago did they realise there was a problem. It wasn't level. There was a hump in the middle that needed slicing off. A bit like when you bake a cake and you need to flatten it. But nowhere near as simple as that. Because that pencil underneath is really difficult to budge. It's a bit like you know, bonfire toffee when you have it in a bag and it all kind of clumps together. That's exactly how it behaves. So out with the power tools, the breaker drill, the pickaxe, shovel and spade, and it's all hands on deck. And I'll tell you something, that bit of kit I'm holding there weighs 14.6 kilograms. Just lifting it is a challenge, but pulling it back and forth out of the ground is quite a workout. And with Sid operating the hired compressor, or whacker plate as we call it, we made a good team. So let the challenge begin. Can we level it before lunch? So we're at the garage, <laughs> what will be the garage, bless you, and you can see that the insulation is going down, we had a bit of a problem well, yesterday. It still needs the uh, waterproof membrane putting down, so I'm only put all the insulation down loosely just to make sure it all fits and I'm going to cut around the pipes so I've got a map of where all the insulation goes, yeah. because I can't put the damp proof membrane down until we're ready to pour the concrete because yeah. it'll just turn into a swimming pool. Yeah. So I'm just doing a test fit now and I'll mark these up when I've cut them all. Take them all up again and then the day before the concrete comes then I'll put the damp proof membrane down and hopefully these will all just fit back in where they need to go then. This is out of bounds really since the pipes have been laid just because we don't really want to disturb anything but I've been sent it. I need that. That's one of the things that I need. I'll get that on the way out uh, but I'm the one with the small, smaller feet or at least not big heavy boots so I, I need some blue tape and I need scissors. So I'm going to just go through, look, I can just, <laughs> this is what Jerk reminds me of. When you were little did you used to play that game with them? Um, you know, like elastic 
between the between the elastic. Oh, that's showing my age. It was before YouTube. We had to just <laughs> make do, play with a stick, play with a bit of elastic. Let's have a look. It will be on one of the windows. I can zoom in. Blue tape. I need blue tape. Oh, what's that over there? I'm going to go and see. I think it's over there. Let's have a look. There it is. Look, that's what I need. Good. It's also a bit like when they did, um, you know, the Bush Tugger trials in I'm a Celebrity. I need scissors. I need the scissors. Let me just see if I can spot the scissors in here. Scissors is the other thing I need to get. Or Crystal Maze or something like that. Raven. I've all worked on Raven, you know, children's TV programme. They have little trials like that. Let me look at that window. I'm going to zoom in. I don't think the scissors are there. I don't think they're not there. They're not. I can't see if they're there. Don't think they're there. Let me just come back. I'm going to go back. Put that down here. Oh, look, there's that window there I missed. Let me zoom in. Is that one sticking up out of that box? I think they're there. I think those I think the scissors are there. I've got what I need and I'm out of here before the time is up. There we go, got my scissors. Stop the clock. So being resourceful and thinking outside the box is what you need to do when you're on limited time and budget. And we needed to uh we needed to label these, but the sharpies just didn't work. What can we do to make sure we get the outcome? Know which, which, which piece goes where? And we had to think, what did we have? And we had some blue tape, didn't we? And so you cut the blue tape up and you use the tape itself to make the letters. Look, I think that works really well. The letters, the numbers, sorry. 16, 17, you can read that all right. 13, 10. <laughs> Look, I like the way you've cut the zero out there. Night. So that's solved the problem, isn't it? And uh, whose idea was that? Mine. No, it was yours, darling. What were you saying? Yours are a bit more Chinese looking. Well, since they're a bit communist, you know what I mean? Like that. But this, that's out of this 11 looks a bit communist -y. Let's have a look. That t yeah, I like that. Whereas mine, I've got more of a sort of manga Chinese. What's that thing. one? What do you mean, what's that one? You three, three, two, three. They have, yeah, yours are a little bit more sculpted at the edges. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that is. And I <laughs> fell down on the four and the five. That you one five was you can read it. You're just saying you're going to take 17 out and stack that first and then 16, 15 and go all the way back so that one is at the top of the pile for when you're putting them back down. Yeah. This is a spaghetti junction. But it's quite some kit, isn't it? That will be where the air source heat pump will go. The first thing that Noel said to me when I arrived, not quite the first thing, but in the first day, uh, you said we need to sit down and talk about heat pumps and Hawaii. I hadn't realised that it was contentious really and also there are a lot of minefields there are different choices to make about not only the manufacturer but about the size of the um, size of the tank and whether you're getting the right one for your needs and also the fact that people have different opinions about them don't they everybody has a different so what we've done is, we've done our research, <laughs> as you do, <laughs> but we've also spoken to people who not only install them and who've had experience of installing them in lots of different types of homes, but also that have them themselves mm. in their own homes. So that for us is quite a well, strong, that's the best way to do it. strong authority, isn't it? You know, so um, yeah. So the, at the beginning, it was a between which manufacturer to go, go for. Well, it was three, wasn't it? It was Stiebel Eltron, which is a German make. It was Mitsubishi, which is Japanese, which everybody seems to have. Yeah. It just seems to be the standard across the board, really. Yeah. Or the Thermia, Thermia which is Scandinavian. Scandinavian, it's yeah. It's a Swedish brand, isn't it? Yeah. Which we found out later is owned by Stiebel Eltron. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and it's whether it's like when you're choosing a car. Do you go for the car where you think, oh, they'll get lots of parts because if, if everybody's got one, any engineer that comes will be able to fix that if there's a problem. Or do you, you know, there are pros and cons for each one. All the time, that's the thing. And when you ask on Facebook, someone will say, oh, I love my Mitsubishi. Someone will always yeah. say, you can get more confused. Yeah. But we, we, we liked the Scandinavian one, didn't we? Because it like said that. it was... It just seemed very simple. You turn it on. Reliable. And it's reliable. Yeah. And it just chugs away. Yeah. And, and we know that some people say, well, in Scandinavia, the, the, the um, climate is slightly different. It's, it's dry. Cold, but it's dry. Dry, whereas it's well, wet it's in Ireland. Wet here. Yeah. But we did speak to engineers here, and they didn't seem to have a problem with it. We went to... People who supply heat pumps, independent people, not mm. not people who yeah. plug a certain one. Who are being sponsored, sort of thing. And thing. also different reps and different people, and they kind of all said, "If it was me, I'd go for the I'd go for the Thermia." Yeah, so that's what we decided Between to do. Between the Mitsubishi and the Thermia, and the I just Eltron just was. Way out I had a hunch of in that intuitive, quite intuitive. And when you first told me, and I don't know a great deal about it, I just said that's the one I'm thinking, leaning towards. Mm. And you changed your mind at one bit, but then having it's spoken to someone else, you came back to the one. I said great because I thought that from the beginning, just yeah. I, I, yeah. you know, intuitively. So that's good. So we're going for that one. The next thing was the size of the of the tank, wasn't it? Uh, we're, we well, there'll only be you and I, and then there'll be Sid, obviously. But Sid will be kind of off doing other things, possibly away at college, different mm. things like that. But it's only going to be a three-person family, and so we didn't really need more than a one eighty, did we? Well, the reckon for a three, you reckon you, the the equation you make is between thirty and forty liters per person per day of hot mm. water, mm. which seems like a lot. But then if you think you take a shower. Well, we don't ten now. minutes in the shower, you you kind of used your. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yeah. spent ten minutes in the shower in the last three weeks, have we? <laughs> Longer for you, but yeah, I, I think that you just have to look how, what what is your usage. And the downside of having a smaller tank is that you know it might be that the demand on it is such that oh, you've run out of water, you'll have to wait a bit till you have your shower. But that would be if you had lots of people all wanting a shower mm. at the same time. It's the equivalent of when you boil a kettle and you think, well, I, I'm only going to. It's only me. Well, quite good as storage units if you if you can heat a massive tank up yeah then it will stay hot for a long time yeah yeah that's that's the thing so in some ways having a big storage unit is a good thing but then if it does go cold heating it all back up again yeah is, is yeah so i suppose if somebody's got a, a larger one that analogy mm. of the kettle was the point i was trying to make mm. was that if you, you you'd only you don't boil a whole kettle if you're only going to use one cup mm. Because it's, it seems wasteful to have it just standing there yeah. and not being used. But yeah. you're saying it, it can stay warm. The other thing about things staying warm is the fact that um, people have said about, oh, if there's a power cut, you know, you'll be, you'll be stuck if there's a power cut and you, mm -hmm. you've got your air source heat pump. Um, Billy was just telling us today, we were chatting about it, and said it takes quite a long time for it to stay, the, the concrete will hold the heat. Well, that would the be the heat. same equation with a big tank of water. So yeah. If you had a massive tank Holds of hot heat. water and you didn't have power for mm. two or three days, yeah. you'd still have warm water yeah. a couple of days down that, but only, yes. only the day after. Yes. But if you have a power cut, you just yes. don't you go in the shower, do you? Or you don't go, run a bath or... Mm. You just adapt to yourself. And then we know that there are power cuts here. Mm. So I think that the contingency is that we are going to have a, a wood burning stove in the little, what we call the green room or the snug, which I'll be talking about a lot. It's probably end up being my favorite room because I'm quite excited about it. It's the one that we're going to have fun with in terms of decor and everything and go maximalist with, very different to the rest of the house. So it'll just be that coziness feel to sitting in there with your books and your throws and your rugs and just getting all cozy warm in winter. So that will be a, in terms of having a warm room in terms of heat food and heating food and so we're going to just still have the gas canister we think we'll just still use in, in the in the garage come yeah not garage outdoor kitchen whatever it's going to be we'll attached be, to it at the back we'll keep the gas bowl and we'll yeah. buy it, even if a it's stove. just a single burner that we can use yeah. over there yeah so we'll be fine we'll survive we'd be <laughs> if you've survived through the winter just in that little caravan you'll well, be we'll fine we'll be getting the solar as well yeah. don't forget yeah that's your so good we'll point have storage there and and we'll even in the winter as long as they're clear We'll still, we'll still be creating power. 
which brings us to our last point, the main point, which is just efficiency and, and, and trying to be self-sufficient, but also how much things cost in the long term. And Billy said this morning when we were chatting to it, because we'd said, well, you know, we've had people some criticising and saying, you know, um, I'd think twice, you're not doing the right thing. So he said to him, what are your options? Our options are, we are we're off grid in the sense we, we, we can't just um, connect up to the gas supply so we have to look at the alternatives and the other only other only other alternative would be oil or electric oil yeah, or electric, electric oil, yeah. and we obviously we've got electric electricity yeah. and that's where the, the solar panels come in because we'll be generating some electricity mm. and hopefully using that at some time of the parts of the year we'll be able to manage on that we might even be lucky we don't know we might be feeding back into the grid if we have a lovely well if we had a spell like we did yeah. the other week we would yeah so um so we've got but we've got the the connection to the grid as a backup so yes we've got electricity but oil is now this is where you talk about the efficiency of it yeah unit per unit he yeah. was explaining that one well, kilo they say, they say some of the the newer oil burners are 100 percent efficient Right, so that means one kilowatt. So one kilowatt of energy in, you yeah. get one kilowatt of heat out. Right, which sounds good. Right, you're not losing boiler, any. A normal gas boiler is between 60 and 80%. Right. So you're putting more energy in than you're getting energy out. Yes. Whereas which a, is a big tick for oil in, in that sense. But then when you compare that to air source heat pump, mm -hmm. you're putting one kilowatt of energy in mm -hmm. and you're getting between three and four. Between three and four, so it's like 400% efficient, for two, mm. 100, mm. 100 in, 400 mm. out. So that, that then just feels like a no-brainer. It's not, it, and they work better in certain types of houses. So having a, a bungalow where you've got that ground space is ideal for an air source heat pump, for the underfloor heating system. Well, it means your whole new floor is a massive radiator, you see. Yeah. You know, and we don't have any radiators on the walls, which means you're not thinking, oh, I can't put that furniture here or there, or just the practicality of that. Can't hang wet towels up, <laughs> no, Nowhere to hang the wet towels, no. <laughs> but um, I'll just lay them on the floor now. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so all things measured. I, and, uh, you know, if, if you, it might be different if you had a two-storey house, for example. There might be other issues if you were in the town and so on, and you had other options available, I don't know. Well, a lot of houses, he wouldn't have the space to put yeah. a heat pump outside as because well. Because it's massive, yeah. It needs it its own room, it doesn't it? a bit of space around it. And it's probably not particularly pretty to look at. Neighbours might complain. You know, it's just your context no, of no, how no, you're no, using they it, aren't isn't beautiful, it? beautiful, I must admit. Yeah. And you can't box them in either. Yeah. You can't make them look pretty. Because bright. they've got to be exposed and yeah. got to have the air yeah. that they can suck in. So, there we go. I don't know if that was a little bit technical or a little bit boring for some of you, but for those of you who may be just considering it and, and, and have similar situations to us, like if you are doing a renovation and you've got in a similar place, mm. similar I'm, situation. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I really want one. But, like you say, you speak to 10 different people and they have 10 different opinions. And only time and will tell. As, some people yeah. absolutely hate them. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And so we promised that we would do, in a year's time, when, we, or when we've been living and using it for a year, yeah. we will do a review of it. An honest review. An honest <laughs> review. And even five years down the line, a review. I think that one, one criticism or one something somebody raised, they said, well, you can't, get to this, you can't get to them if there's a problem. You wait till you've got a problem. <laughs> I think they were talking about the pipes under the, under the slab, though. Because I think that people just are frightened by that. You know, the yeah. fact that everything's going to get concreted yeah. over. And what if there was a problem? You had to get access to it and you've got to, you know, smash your floor up. Mm. But that's really like looking at the worst case scenario. And people have been using these and doing this technology and doing it for years now mm. in other places. Mm. So this is why they have these certain types of sp uh, pipes that are deliberately designed for Yeah, and he's tested insulated everything. He's, he's pumped pipe. four bars of pressure in, into all the pipes and left, left them at four bars. Mm. And if they can withstand that, they'll, they'll withstand two bars of pressure when, when they're running. Right, yeah, so yeah. So it should be fine. They should be fine and we're going for it, so watch this space and we'll report back. This is the life now. <laughs> and the sound of the trickling stream in the background. And the nip of the midges. Have you been feeling them? Yeah, I can out
sitting on a splinter. 